good to be in this virtual space with all of you. One of my jobs is to let you know that this event is being recorded. You would have just heard that announcement. And I also uh, want to start off in a good way by recognizing that today I am situated on Treaty 6 here in Amiskwache, Wisconsin, with the Beaver Hills House, uh, what we often refer to as Edmonton. I am deeply, deeply grateful to all of the First Peoples of this land whose cultures, languages, perspectives, and histories enrich my life and indeed our lives in many ways every day. I also recognize and acknowledge the historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit endure in this country we call Canada and accept responsibility as Dean of a Faculty of Education to contribute toward accounting for and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, our research, our leadership, and our service. And I will turn it over to the amazing Dr. Cheryl Poth from here. Thanks, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. We're just delighted uh, to be here in this space together and to have our wonderful speaker, Dr. Stefan Polkamp with us today as a visiting scholar. Just before we were talking about how it kind of feels normal having a visiting scholar, and he's actually here in Edmonton as well, which is just a wonderful thing. And so I'm really happy to be here in the capacity of the in, in playing the interim role of Associate Dean of Research. And Dr. Polkamp is a visiting scholar from RWTH, Action University in Germany. And, and Stefan, I actually looked up what, what the acronym meant. Um, and it's quite challenging. Would you say it for us? Just so that you can. Uh, Westfälische Technische Hochschule. So it's probably a good thing I didn't try to attempt that, but I was yeah. curious, just, just so you know. He completed a doctorate in mathematics education, specializing in prescriptive modeling. A few fun facts about Dr. Polkamp is that he has completed the entire Camino de Santiago, which I've read much about, but I've not yet dared to do, walking from Portugal to Spain. During his long walk, he took the opportunity to speak with new people every day, to walk with, and to have extraordinary conversations, often in four languages at one time. On that note, he is a multilingual, having taught internationally in Europe and Canada, include teaching a year in French in Quebec, and also in Belgium to a German-speaking minority. One thing he has shared about his time here in Edmonton is that, like me, he is often overwhelmed by the West Edmonton Mall. And did you find your way around it okay this time? Yes. <laughs> he is a consummate teacher because he values establishing a relation with others and starting a dialogue. He often talks about knowledge becomes more when it is shared. On that note, and before I, took, I turn it over to our speaker, I'd like to thank him in advance for sharing his expertise with us during his talk, which is titled, Between Humboldt's Ideal and the Belief in Selection, an Overview of Germany's Education System and Contemporary Challenges. I know we have a lot of knowledge to gain from him. So welcome. Thank you for the kind introduction to the Dean and to the Associate Dean. So um, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, let me just share the slides. So yes, now you should see the slides. So indeed, I want to give you a short, brief introduction into the German education system. Be, of course, I can only choose some aspects um, to talk about, but if you have any question, I hope that at the end we can um, have a discussion and maybe a comparative um, approach um, of the Canadian and the German education system. So I want to start with two books that I found. Um, they were published in the 60s um, but they are st the titles are still relevant to current discussions in the German education political discussion. So on the left, we see Bildung as a citizen right. So in a first attempt, I will try to give you the idea to translate Bildung by um, education. But further on, I will explain why I think it's untranslatable. So this is a very um, positive, idealistic way of seeing education um, and it's linked to citizenship and to democracy and on the right we see the German education catastrophe so a very negative view um, on education and that the system um, has to be improved 
Um, so, and these are the two extremes that are very present in the germ education debate as we uh, will see. So for the structure, um, first I will have to admit, so the presentation today uh, doesn't, isn't based on my research um, that I presented uh, at the last talk at the semester talk, but um, it's more, I gathered uh, information from other uh, researchers that I want to present to you. So first of all, I want to talk about Bildung and maybe untranslatable German concept. Then I want to talk about the federal um, education system. Then I will present you two events that have shocked um, Germans and have influenced the German uh, education system. At last but not least, I want to uh, present to you two characteristic feature, features of the tertiary education in Germany. Um, and then I hope that we can start um, discussion. So, um, Peter Burke, thank you again, um, recommended me a book about um, Americans and German education. And in this book, the concept of Bildung was discussed as well. And I found the quote, the object of all true education is not to make men carpenters, it is to make carpenters men. And I think this is a first good characterization of what is meant by the German word Bildung, and uh, the author continues and she says, um, Bildung is a uniquely German concept that combined individual intellectual and moral betterment. Um, when we talk in Germany about Bildung, we often have a historical reference. You can refer to um, Kant as well, Sapere Aude, the, the slogan of the Enlightenment, but we often refer to Wilhelm von Humboldt because he was not, he was not only an intellectual, but also a statesman who um, did some educational uh, reforms. For him, Bildung is the true purpose of a human. And the first condition of Bildung is freedom. So it's always linked to a citizenship and to enlightenment. And Bildung is a never ending process. It's a, it's a, life, a lifelong learning process. Um, and you are never finished learning um, or ga gaining Bildung. Um, just one little remark. Um, we talk about the guy on the left. Normally, I think that the guy on the right is more prominent in, uh, on this continent because it's his brother and he was a geographer in the Americas. And I think he um, named some animals and um, rivers Humboldt, but this is the wrong Humboldt. Today, I want to talk about Wilhelm. So, um, to summarize the whole historical debate about building, I will give you five dimensions of building that are aspects of building nowadays. So first of all, it's the self-education. Um, it comes from the fact that we have two verbs for to educate. So there is at Ziehen, this would mean to educate someone and there would be sich bilden, so educate yourself. So this reflexive verb, uh, where Bildung is built off um, refers to the act that um, school or books can always only be an offer and that every individual has to accept this offer of education and has to go through it on its own. And Bildung um, addresses the whole personality. It's not only an intellectual, it's also moral, spiritual, um, or social learning and building is the re response to an anthropologic need. So uh, in difference to, to animals, it isn't enough for a human to drink, to eat or to sleep. And building is exactly the, the thing that differs us from um, animals. Um, and of course, I talked about the self-education. Bildung is an individual act, but it also 
always is connected to a social responsibility. You can't have Bildung if you are selfish and if you don't care about society and the others. And Bildung is always an intellectual struggle. It's not easy to to have the knowledge. It's not easy to be a good man. So it's always um, about overcoming obstacles as well. This is also why the author Levin, I already talked about, says German Bildung, she translated it with self-cultivation, was always elitist. And she is right because not, not everyone has the time or the money to um to deepen the his or her education in such a um, moral and intellectual deep way um, but on the other hand i want to make the point that bildung had always have the have always had the meaning of allgemeinbildung general knowledge so building for everyone um, in the german tradition there is the idea of comenius omnes omnia omnino so everything to everyone body thoroughly and um, humboldt himself wrote one is only a good artisan soldier merchant if one according to his status is an enlightened man and citizen so already for him it was clear that even um lower classes at his his time have to be citizens and have to be enlightened and have to know more than a vocational uh, knowledge. And um, I think he was a man of his time. So the according to his status refers to the class society of his time. But today he wouldn't say this again and he would enlarge on the perspective for everyone. And Engels who worked with Marx um, already had this progressive um, liberative function of building in mind when he said vocational education is the general knowledge of the oppressed, general knowledge is the vocational education of the ruler. So um, I want to close this introduction or this reflection on building by two very modern definitions. So the first one would be a philosophical, the classical German concept of Bildung as an individual process of self-formation through confrontation with and acquisition of culture in an all-encompassing view is the answer of the question, what constitutes the humanity of human beings? And the more pragmatic approach of allgemeinbildung, of general knowledge, of building for everyone would um, answer the question, what should students learn and how? And with this question um, uh, that comes from the discussion about building, you can um, design a curriculum, you can plan a lesson unit, or you can plan uh, one concrete lesson as well. So from this philosophical background, I want to go in the uh, uh, specific German system, but to be honest, I can't speak of a system because it's more than one system. We have a, we have a um, federal system. We have 16 uh, Länder, so provinces. The singular of Länder would be Land. Um, and please, um, be aware that there is a big difference regarding surface and a big difference um, regarding um, population and so of density between these lender and there are three cities um, about the size of Edmonton, um, Bremen, Hamburg and Berlin who are as city an independent um, province and in the German constitution it is stated that the responsibility for education belongs to each land, each province. Um, so we have 16 um, different systems. Um, and there is a federal ministry of education, but um, she is more focused on um, universities. And um, if 
for example, with the digitalization, the federal government wanted to give more money to schools to support digitalization. We had to change um, the constitution so that the federal government um, was able to spend money on schools. So the most national important institution for national cooperation is the KMK, the Standing Conference of the Ministers of Education and Cultural Affairs of the Lender. Um, so there, every provincial government sends um, a deputy, and then, but they have to agree. Everything, everyone has to agree, and then they can um, decide on things in education. And they decided on national standards. We will talk about it um, later. So we have provincial curricula, but they have to respect the national standards that has been um, agreed on by the CAMCA. So um, I said we have 16 um, different systems. Nevertheless, I want to try to give you an overview of common features uh, with this image. So we have a primary school. Normally, it's about four years. And when the students are 10 years old, um, they are classified, separated, and sent to different schools. Some, um, um, some lender have uh, an orientation phase, um, but normally there are traditional um, three kinds of different schools. So there's the gymnasium, it's the school with the most prestige, and it prepares for university. And then we have the Realschule, it's like the middle school um, that prepares for non-academic middle class professions. And then we have the Hauptschule uh, that prepares for um, labor work. So um, this might be shocking for you to, to see that the kids are different, separated so early. Um, I think it's a German speaking tradition. I, I know that in Austria and Switzerland, they do kind of the same thing. But already when we talk in Europe and when I talk to Scandinavian colleagues, they are so shocked because it, um, yeah, they don't understand it and they have a total different approach about thinking about equality and um, yeah, fairness in education system. But behind this idea is a strong, deep-seated belief in Germany that for the teacher and especially for the kids, it is better to be in a group of equals and that they get better support and um, that can, they can learn better if they are in a group um, of uh, peers. Um, in the 60s, there were the Gesamtschule, the creation of the Gesamtschule. So this, there are two kinds of Gesamtschule. One that is uh, integrated Gesamtschule where you have all kids in one school, but there's also the Gesamtschule where you have uh, one building, but in the building you have the three, three different traditional um, schools. So I know you are wondering about some data. Uh, so one in three child, one of three child and child goes to a gymnasium. Um, and this um, number is relatively stable. Um, and you see that um, over the last 10 years, we see a loss in, of students in the Realschule and um, in the Hauptschule and the Gesamtschule either the integrated um, one or the other one um, are on the rise. And in fact, there are a lot of uh, researchers that say that there is a trend over all provinces to a two school system. So there's the gymnasium and there is other kinds of school. And all these schools have in common that they are not a gymnasium, and that, but they are trying to um, open the way to the university as well, but still preparing for um, non-academic professions as well. Um, 
the German society is mostly a society of compromise. We don't have a minority um, government, so parties have to agree to form a government. Um, of course, we have also like the Trump movement that there's a loud minority um, that tries to sabotage every compromise. Um, but um, despite the fact of a compromise society, I think the education system is one of the question where the political discussion can be heated. And it was one of the topic where you definitely can easily um, recognize um, which political opinion a person have, uh, has because um, yeah, the parties on the center uh, right wing um, try to defend um, this system and the other um, parties on their center, center left, um, try to um, reform the system. So um, probably it would, it would have been better if two persons were here, uh, one who defend the system and one to um, criticize the system because probably my presentation will be a little biased because I think that we have to reform the system. And I give you some biased, um, from my point of view, um, inf information why the system isn't just. Um, so there is a discriminatory effect of the, the other one would say that the kids are only um, selected by intellectual performance. But for example, PISA has shown they have um, made group of professions and a child um, with a parent belonging to the professions with the highest prestige have a chance of 58% to go to a gymnasium. Um, remember, normally a, a one of three children goes to the gymnasium. And uh, while a child with a parent belonging to unskilled, semi-skilled or agricultural workers only have a probability of 19% to go to a gymnasium. And um, you see in the reading competency um, of PISA, you see a difference uh, um, <clears throat> of more than 100 points in the competency between these socioeconomic um, backgrounds. And it has something to do uh, to which schools um, the child, child can go. Um, and there's also a discriminatory effect um, regarding immigration. Um, because um, in Canada, you see that there's no difference between students with an immigration background and students with no immigration background. But you see that there's a huge difference in Germany. Um, just to give you some information, for a long time, Germany refused to admit that they are a country of immigration. Um, and um, this had a huge influence on uh, school um, because um, they would earn education because they were convinced that the children um, of immigrants will leave one day because they are only here for a visit. Um, so um, in Germany, 26% of children um, have an immigration background. In Canada, it's 40 in this uh, survey. Um, and what is really interesting is that 72% of children with an immigration background in Germany speaks Germ speak German at home, while in Canada, only 62% speak a national um, language at home. Uh, and it's, it is so interesting because um, the main priority in Germany is that um, a child uh, with an immigration background should speak German. And even if uh, in Germany, uh, more students speak German at home, um, they perform um, not as good as um, Canadian students with an immigration um, background relatively to um, the students mm -hmm. with a no immigration um, background. Uh, was there a question? No, I thought I heard mm -hmm. something. Okay. Um, so talking about PISA, PISA was really 
a shock, the first uh, PISA um, survey, um, because Germany um, was performing poorly in all three categories. They were in all three categories below the average. And for a small country with no resource, um, we believe for a long time that education is this uh, this thing that why we can compete on an international level. So um, the PISA first PISA result was a clash between the own aspiration and the aging truth. On the right, um, you see um, a cover from uh, the largest German magazine of high journalism. So it's not yellow press. And they are writing, um, are German students stupid? Um, and um, there were, at the beginning, in the discussion, they tried to make excuses. Oh, you can't measure. Um, the philosophical um, idea of building by a simple um, PISA test. And there were other arguments um, that said, okay, German students um, didn't try hard enough. They didn't um, recognize that the test was important. They are not used to tests like the PISA test. Um, but nevertheless, um, there were um, political consequences. There were many reforms. Um, the governments um, invested in early childhood education. Um, full day schools became more and more um, normal. So I was in school when the reforms were implemented. So I wasn't infected by them. So I'm the last generation of the Asian system. And for me, it was totally normal to be at home for lunch, to be at home at one um, PM because our school was only in the morning. So this gives you an idea about the cultural differences. Um, then now there's more individual support for children. Um, they have um, created the national standards. I talked about it, it was in the Kaim car. And um, the national standards have a competence orientation. So there isn't not only content, um, that has to be taught, but they also define um, things that students should be able to do. Um, and the big reform was also that most province, provinces uh, implemented a provincial wide central abitur. So this is the last exam at, a, exam at a school before going to a university. And before it was always the teacher who designed the exam and now all students in one province um, pass the same exam and provided by the government. The only thing that they didn't change was the multi-track um, school system. And in fact, they tried. So in Hamburg, there were a black green government. So a government between the conservatives and the green party uh, that are really opposed in education policy. And nevertheless, they compromised and they found a reform to reform the multi-track um, uh, system, education system. But then the citizens started a referendum and the referendum stopped the um, reform of the multi-track um, system. So you see that um, the belief in selection is so strong and so deep seated um, that even in a referendum of the whole population of one province, it is uh, in the majority. Um, so uh, all these reforms um, were kind of successful. Um, Germany is one of the countries that um, succeeded to gain a competence or better results in PISA over the time. Um, and it's now better in every, every category than the OECD um, average. Um, in my opinion, um, it's sad that uh, it was so successful without changing the school system. And what is really an obstacle to any further reforms as well is the fact that the provinces that have the strongest and um, most separating school system that they perform 
um, the best on the PISA test. So it isn't that the lender that have a more inclusive system are better in um, the PISA test. The second event I want to talk to you about because it really, um, yeah, hit the discourse hard was um, the visit of the UN um, Special Rapporteur of the, on the right to education. Um, he wanted to analyze the German education system in 2006 because he wanted to know how a federal education system looks like. He wanted to see the reforms after PISA. He wanted to look at the multi-track um, system because it's so unique in the world. And um, as I told you, there was the paradigm shift on migration and he wanted to see how this influenced the education policy. The, his, um, yeah, his recommendations were really controversially um, discussed in Germany um, because for persons who wanted to, or who still wants to defend the multi-track system, um, it was, um, yeah, a, 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 a loss, a really um, a hard, um, um, a hard counter-argument because he clearly um, stated what he thinks about the multi-track system. So he urged the government to reconsider the multi-track school system which is selective and could lead to a form of de facto discrimination and he also stated that the classification process which takes place at lower secondary level and um, does not assess students in an adequate manner and instead of being inclusive is exclusive um unfortunately um it was controversially discussed but then ignored um so even this very clear report of the United Nations didn't change the education system in Germany, at least not in the in the important part of the multi-track system. Um, so we are still, um, yeah, we are. Some are still hoping that one day there will be the big reform, and others um, have arranged with the system. Um, so. This is, these are the two events that really have marked the education discourse in the last 10, 15 years, um, but there is no solution inside. Um, so to switch to something more positive, um, I want to talk to you about the vocational system. For us, it's post-secondary education because you can do the vocational training after you've finished um, at least Realschule and Hauptschule, so the um, so not uh, gymnasium schools. And um, it's a dual professional training because the person works in companies or in a company or in a crafts enterprise or in some small business or even in big industry. But uh, one or two days per week, um, the person goes to a vocational school and the employer pays a salary, but the school is free. Um, and this professional training, dual because it's in a company and in a school, um, this um, professional training um, takes normally three years. And at the end, there are certified diploma um, and um, the whole um, training um, followed defined curricula, uh, defined curricula by the state, by the government. And um, so there are clear um, achievements that can entitle to study at least at a University of Applied Science, or that gives you um, clear um, ideas what you have to do to um, go to a university. And so this is the second possibility, the second route to get to university. You do go to a school that is not a gymnasium. Um, you leave it after 10 years and then you make a professional training um, and then um, you can um, probably go to uh, a university. Sometimes it depends on the training. Sometimes you have to um, add some 
um, evening courses, and then you can go to the university. And this dual professional training is quite a success. And there are some many countries that cooperate with Germany because they want to implement the system um, as well. And if you look, for example, during the financial and economic crisis um, in the last years, um, when you look at youth unemployment, um, Germany always better performed um, in youth unemployment than the other countries because um, persons um, are secured by this kind of dual professional training. They are already in an enterprise in a, in a company. So um, even after the training, um, they often um, stays with this kind of um, job. Um, so this is really a good thing, I think. Um, and as we are um, at the Faculty of Education, I want to talk briefly about the teacher training. So teacher training is very diverse in Germany because it, of course, it depends on the province, what else, but um, you also have to consider the multi-track system. So general trends are that there are at least four different kinds of teacher training. So it depends whether you want to go to a, want to become a teacher at a primary school, if you want to become a teacher at a gymnasium, or if you want to become a teacher at a other secondary school, or if you want to become a teacher at a vocational school. Um, you have to study at least two subjects at the university to be able to teach two subjects at school. You can't be, become a teacher if you don't have two subjects. Um, and a master degree is necessary to start to work um, at a school. Um, and even you, if you have a master degree, there is like a practical training um, at the beginning of your school career. So you are already, it reminds a lot of the dual professional training. You are already teaching and working in a school for four days a week, but one day a week you go to a third uh, institution that isn't your university, that isn't your school to um, get um, instruction, help. And uh, once you have finished this referendariat, this normally, it normally takes eight, 18 months, then you are a fully teacher with all uh, the privileges of being a teacher. So um, this um, is teacher training in Germany. So of course I was too fast, I forgot something. So now is the time to um, ask details that you want to know that uh, where I was unclear, where I was too fast, but uh, I also invite you um, to raise questions or um, comment on um, interesting facts, similarities, differences that you see between the German and Canadian uh, education uh, system. So, but first of all, thank you for your attention and I can put um, the presentation in the chat so that everyone has access to it. Um, yeah, so, and I'm glad that we can have a discussion together. Thank you so much, Stefan. It was a treat to learn more about the German education system and to hear about um, even your biases. I'm gonna be honest, I love it when we have our biases <laughs> exhibited and participating. Now I'm gonna invite colleagues, there is a small enough number of us, I believe we can ask questions